Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to this general session of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society. I'm Val Johnson, the uh, historian of this organization. And uh, if you see me standing around with my camera, just smile pretty because you'll be in next year's pictures and you want to have a really nice photo. Some of you are grumpy, so uh, I, I have to make that reminder. Also, if anyone left any belongings in the other room where we had the earlier morning sessions, uh, you can't leave them in there because they'll be turning that room into the dining room. Uh, anything that you may have left will be out at the registration desk. So uh, uh, if, if you thought you left something behind in there that you were going to return to, uh, go to the registration desk to pick it up. <clears throat> we appreciate you being here. We appreciate the vendors who are outside and, and appreciate you going to visit with them. They, are, uh, they help sponsor this meeting, which helps to keep the expenses uh, of the organization and your dues uh, unreasonably low. I, I, <laughs> I think that uh, as you attend other meetings and, and know what, uh, what we pay for, other meetings with CME credit, uh, that this meeting is the bargain of the nation, if not the bargain of the world. We have great speakers, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker. John Berry uh, is speaking to us now. He's sponsored by Associates in Radiology. Uh, we appreciate them uh, in this sponsorship. <clears throat> John Berry is a prize winning and New York Times best-selling author. Uh, his book, Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, and How It Changed America, won the 1998 Francis Parkman Prize of the Society of American Historians for that year's best book of American history. He serves on advisory boards at MIT's Center for Engineering Systems Fundamentals, the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And after Hurricane Katrina, which he will speak to us about today, uh, the Louisiana congressional delegation asked him to chair a bipartisan, bipartisan, I'm not sure what that means, a bipartisan working group on flood control. And in 2007, he was appointed to both the Southeast Louisiana Flood Control Authority, which oversees six levy districts in the metropolitan New Orleans area. This is sort of difficult for me to read. We live in a desert. We don't know about levees. We hardly know about water. Also, he was on the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, which develops and implements uh, the hurricane protection plan for the state of Louisiana. He's a frequent guest on, on uh, shows ranging from Meet the Press to uh, National Public Radio. I'd like you to welcome John Berry. Thank you. Uh, there's a uh, word in uh, Louisiana called lanyap, which is uh, something unexpected and, and extra. And when uh, Mark Johnson invited me to uh, uh, give the talk on influenza. In fact, this is probably the most far, farthest in advance I've ever scheduled any talk. I think it goes back at least 18 months ago, uh, and maybe longer than that. Anyway, I asked him if he, uh, also, I'd be happy to also talk on Katrina, and uh, he, he uh, thought that would be a good idea. So here I am. Uh, there actually, I, I could sort of shoehorn some relevance into the medical profession. Hurricanes certainly are a, a public health hazard, even though you don't really face much of them in uh, Utah. But the rest of the world does. Well over half the world's population lives in coastal areas. Uh, and even in terms of the current influenza concerns, there are some lessons learned from Katrina. One it involves N95 masks. Uh, after the hurricane, there were, you know, the city was vacant, 
standing water in, in homes, no air conditioning, there was a lot of mold, and professionals who knew how to use N95 masks were going into these homes dealing with the mold. And a study afterwards found that only 34% of these professionals put the N95 mask on properly and, and maintained them while they were in the homes. So they were facing a risk, they were pros, and they still didn't get it right. Uh, so, that, so for those who think N95s are going to be a solution in any kind of widespread way for, uh, for influenza or, frankly, uh, other respiratory diseases, I think you need to reconsider that. But back to uh, what, I, what I want to show you, and this is only the set. I give a lot of talks, but this is only the second PowerPoint presentation I've ever given in my life. I'm, I'm sort of a Luddite when it comes to technology. I use a DOS word processor. This, yeah, and not for which I've been using since 1984. It's the best one ever designed. Uh, this is a storm surge barrier in Maastricht, Holland. As you can see, this is a very impressive engineering work. This is a storm surge barrier that protects London, another amazing engineering feat. This is a storm surge barrier in Nagoya, Japan. Again, a significant work of engineering. Now, the next slide relates to a U.S. city that's not exactly known for its hurricanes. That's Providence, Rhode Island, the storm surge barrier protecting Providence, Rhode Island. There were hurricanes that flooded the city in 1938 and 1954, and after the 54 hurricane, the Eisenhower administration, which was very much into infrastructure, they built the interstate highway system and so forth, built this. That's a storm surge barrier in New Orleans. <laughs> that was designed in the Reagan administration and completed in 1999, six years before the hurricane. And that is a statement of public policy. You go back to when we cared about infrastructure to when we cared mostly about money. There were 1,500 dead. That structure was simply badly designed. It collapsed in front of a storm that it was designed to hold. That structure collapsed, flooded the city, when the water did not, was two feet below the top of the wall. And it should have been able to survive when water overtopped the wall. This is just a failure of engineering design. 100% designed and built by the Corps of Engineers, the U.S. government. The local levy board, a lot bad can be said about the local levy board, but had, the local levy board had absolutely nothing to say about the design or construction of this flood protection system. They had no input. The Corps paid no attention to them. Okay, now, when you all think of the Mississippi River, I'm sure most of you think of the river that goes from above Minneapolis, almost in a straight line, down to New Orleans. When I think of the Mississippi River, that's the Mississippi River. Into the Rockies, into Canada, into Montana, all the way to Buffalo, New York, down North Carolina, cuts through Alabama. That's the Mississippi River. You could just as well say that the Mississippi starts up there or over here as you as, as say that it starts right there. Just as accurate. All that water goes down through New Orleans. And another thing of great consequence, which I'm sure you're unaware of, is that right around there is Cape Girardeau, Missouri. The Gulf of Mexico used to go up to Cape Girardeau, Missouri. All the land between Cape Girardeau, wherever it is, and the present site of the mouth of the Mississippi River was built by the deposit of sediment of the Mississippi River. That's 35,000 square miles. 
in seven states. So the thing that you need to understand when you look at the situation on the Gulf Coast is that sediment flow. That is enormously important to what's going on in Louisiana. All that red and brown area, that is coastal Louisiana that has disappeared. And most of that's roughly 2,000 square miles of land has disappeared, most of it in the last 50 years. If you take 2,000 square miles, which is the same as the size of the state of Delaware, and you wrap it around New Orleans, New Orleans does not need any levees. It is perfectly safe. New Orleans historically is not particularly vulnerable to hurricanes. It has become vulnerable because of the erosion of the coast. And people refer to it as wetlands. It's not all wet. Some of it that's now gone was just as solid as the main street in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, once you step off what used to be the coast. Some of it very, was very solid land. It's now gone. And the key to understanding what's going on in Louisiana and the key to understanding how to fix it is to understand why 2,000 plus square miles of Louisiana have disappeared. And it's not just Louisiana, coastal Mississippi is affected as well. And the first reason is the historic sediment load that the Mississippi River carries is now, it has been cut by close to two thirds. There's roughly 30 to 40 percent of the historic amount of sediment the river used to carry is still in the river. So what happened to the rest of it? Now this fact will be somewhat surprising to you and there are six dams on the upper Missouri River, one in Montana, one in North Dakota, and four in South Dakota. These are enormous projects they created reservoirs whose coastline is longer than the state of California. They were built to provide primarily hydroelectric power for the upper Midwest and the high plains. And of course, once it goes on the grid, it's, it's national. But those six dams have retained behind those dams one half of all the sediment that's missing from the Mississippi River, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. When those dams were completed in 1963, according to the USGS, the flow of sediment from the upper Missouri, quote, virtually stopped, unquote. So that's number one. The sediment is missing. There are other dams elsewhere in the system, that, and there are other reasons as well revetments on the, on the river bank and things like that. The, the lower Mississippi River is actually lined with concrete to prevent the erosion of the river bank to keep it from falling into the river. Uh, but the biggest single uh, retention of sediment is those six dams in the Dakotas up to Montana and just the, the southernmost dams just above the Nebraska state line. That's number one. The second the most of the sediment that remains in the river and that used to be deposited at the mouth of the river and build up land is now carried two and a half miles out into the ocean and deposited off the continental shelf so it's no longer available to build land. And the reason is the deposit of sediment used to create massive sandbars. It was very difficult for shipping to get through there. So they built these jetties it's, it was, uh, and to, to get through those sandbars, it was very efficient, and it opened up the entire Mississippi Valley to shipping. Uh, Pittsburgh is a port with ocean access because of the Mississippi River. Tulsa, Oklahoma is not normally thought of as a port, but it is. It's the uh, it's furthermost reach on, on that river. And it's not an insignificant port in terms of inland commerce, again, because of the Mississippi River and because of those jetties. Uh, you know, obviously, Minneapolis and so forth. 
uh, they're all ports with direct access to the ocean. So those jetties serve interstate and international commerce, but they carry almost all the sediment that remains in the river off the continental shelf. So it's no longer rebuilding Louisiana. And, and currents carried that sediment all the way west to Texas, about 300 miles, as well as east to the Mississippi Gulf Coast and create barrier islands. Barrier islands are called that for a reason. They're barriers, okay? So that's one of the other reasons. A third reason is the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway, which runs from Texas to Florida and was actually built for national security before World War II to protect shipping from German submarines so that it could go on barge traffic and not be on open ocean. And the GIWW allows enormous amounts of saltwater intrusion, which rapidly destroyed and eroded the marsh. The four, and again, built for national security, interstate, and international commerce. The fourth reason is the oil and gas industry. That industry has, has dredged more than 10,000 miles of canals and pipelines through coastal Louisiana. Every inch of those canals and pipelines allow saltwater intrusion, again, eroding land. Again, national interest. Uh, the GIWW has some benefit for Louisiana, but it's more beneficial to Texas and Florida, the terminal points. Uh, obviously, Louisiana gets nothing out of the hydroelectric power built in the upper Midwest. Uh, the fifth reason are the levees themselves which line the river and prevent it from breaking out. If you look down here, where most of the erosion has taken place, nobody lives there. I'm not saying they're lightly populated areas. Nobody lives down there. And the reason you have levees down there is to protect interstate and international commerce, primarily international when you get down that, because it's all going out into the ocean. Uh, if the, if the uh, levees weren't there, the river would, would spread out, it would silt up, do all sorts of things to interfere with international commerce. Uh, again, that is a national benefit. So the, and obviously the Port of New Orleans gained some benefit from that, but it's primarily the rest of the nation. So the point that I've been trying to make here is probably pretty obvious to all of you by now is that benefits that accrue to the entire United States of America are directly responsible for New Orleans' vulnerability to hurricanes. It didn't used to be vulnerable to hurricanes. Most of this land has disappeared in the last 50 years, particularly since the oil and gas industry started drilling. Uh, within the next couple of years, the Corps of Engineers will probably finish a program to give what's referred to as 100-year protection to the New Orleans metropolitan area. And that sounds pretty good. But what it really means is that there's a 100-year protection means there's a 1% chance in any year of a storm striking that is greater than the protection. So what that, if you let simply do the math in the average person's lifetime, that means that there is a much better than 50% chance in their lifetime that they will see a storm greater than 100-year protection. And that is not very good protection. In Holland, they protect to a 10,000-year standard and are now thinking about increasing the standard. In Japan, they protect anywhere, depending on the density of population and the economic value of what they're protecting, anywhere from 100 years to 10,000 years for an urban area, much less a densely populated important area like, like New Orleans. So 100-year protection ain't much. The state is going to be seeking more than that. There will be some proposals coming down the road in the not-too-distant future and frankly, the price tag's pretty steep. 
But this is a classic example of something that you cannot afford not to do. And uh, in fact, I'm a liberal Democrat, but speaking of bipartisanship, uh, Newt Gingrich and I co-authored an essay uh, for Time Magazine a couple of years ago talking about this. And you know, Gingrich understands how important it is and why we should do it. And when I say it's a classic example of something we can't afford not to do, the rest of this coast is going to continue to erode if we don't stop it. And what that means for the nation is, right now, 40% of all the fish, commercial by weight, 40% of all the commercial fish caught in the United States is in coastal Louisiana. You have economic impacts there. 30% of the domestic energy production is in Louisiana or offshore Louisiana. All of that becomes enormously vulnerable. The refining capacity of the country is in that area. You are not going to be able to build an oil refinery anywhere else in the United States. That's irreplaceable. That is all going to be vulnerable. That infrastructure will be destroyed by hurricanes as the coast eats its way into where they are. Oh, Jesus. I don't know. I forgot to. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> OK. Uh, the port system, five of the 15 largest ports in the United States are in Louisiana. Every one of them is vulnerable. That's going to disappear. I said earlier, Pittsburgh and Tulsa are ports because of Louisiana. They don't have any other access to the sea. Now, those of you who know something about history or Galveston uh, may know that in 1900, Galveston had a great hurricane, basically wiped out the city, just as happened last year. And Galveston at the time was the most densely populated, was the biggest city in Texas. And people were saying Galveston would be the next great American city. After it was wiped out, they beat a ship built a ship channel to Houston, and Houston became what Galveston was expected to be. And I've heard since Katrina, a lot of people say, well, you know, Baton Rouge is on high ground. Why don't we just move the port to Baton Rouge? What they don't understand is that the port is actually on essentially 75 miles of continuous wharfage on the lower Mississippi River, all the way from Baton Rouge to New Orleans and a little south of New Orleans. You can't move 75 miles of wharfage. You know, it's there for a reason. All of it's used. The same thing on the Rhine. There's, there's almost the equivalent. Uh, on the Rhine is why Rotterdam, Amsterdam, all those areas are enormous ports. Uh, but it's not just docks in downtown New Orleans, it's a continuous wharfage. Uh, what's another? And 20% uh, of all the waterborne commerce in the United States moves through Louisiana between the Mississippi River and the GIWW. And you know, I could give you other statistics about the port of New Orleans. It's, it's not actually, the, there are four separate port jurisdictions. So when you look at statistics, New Orleans doesn't always rank as high as it should if you understand there are four different jurisdictions. The statistics are all separately figured. But it's really one port. It's the biggest port in the world. It's the only port in the world that used to have a traffic light. Now the technology is such that they don't need one anymore. Uh, all that goes away if it's not protected against hurricanes. Uh, I want to make one other comment about sea level. People talk about New Orleans being below sea level. Well, actually, half of the city is at or above sea level as a statement of fact. But all ports are at sea level by definition. And as soon as you develop them, they sink below sea level. Two-thirds of the Holland is below sea level. If you've ever flown into the airport outside Amsterdam, you landed 20 feet below sea level, lower than any point in Louisiana. The lower Ninth Ward is called lower, not because it's low ground, but because it's downriver. 
Some of the lower Ninth Ward is below sea level. Some of it is as high as any part of New Orleans. And uh, that's actually a good example of the vulnerability of New Orleans. That was not flooded directly from the ocean. That was flooded because of the industrial canal, the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. Those are two man-made channels for international and interstate shipping that carried water into the area and flooded 100,000 people in New Orleans East and the Lower Ninth Ward. And they would have been dry if it weren't for the, for the canals that were man-made, built for commerce. Uh, so I guess I, the, the, the final thing I want to say is this is an issue that's facing the world. It is not simply New Orleans. New Orleans happens to be the point of the spear. But every coastal area in the world is looking at the same problems with rising sea level. And how this nation handles Louisiana is going to be a case study for the rest of the world. Now, we don't know yet whether that case study is going to be something to avoid or something to emulate. And that really depends on what happens in Washington in the next two or three years. Uh, and on that note, and I will say, as I said earlier, uh, it's not just Democrats who want to help the region. Newt Gingrich and other, other Republicans who, who understand what's at stake and the fact that solutions can be found and that this actually could help lead the world in, making solu in, in finding solutions to the coming problems uh, are, are behind it. But it's, it's, it's tough vote. It's going to be expensive. And this is uh, not the greatest climate in the world to ask for money from Washington. Uh, on that, this was uh, the Lanyac talk. And I'm happy to entertain any questions that uh, anybody has for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, there, there's a, uh, there was a plan in the 70s to build uh, gates at the Rigolese is, is the name of that. It's actually a pretty narrow opening. And it would be comparable to the uh, first slide, if we can go back to it, which is in Holland. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers did make those plans. Uh, there were some environmental objections, the court actually ruled that the court had to redo its environmental impact statement. However, instead of doing that, the court abandoned the plan and went another route. Uh, the, the chief of the Army Corps of Engineers at that time is a guy named Vol Heiberg, who's actually become a good friend of mine. Um, and he says the greatest mistake in his life was abandoning that plan. Uh, that w is in most of the proposals for the long-term solution, but you're, you're correct. Lake Pontchartrain, direct access to the Gulf, you get a storm surge coming in the lake, and it could overtop New Orleans from the rear. That, that's what happened in Katrina, but the storm surge, you know, Katrina was a great storm, make no mistake. And in parts of, the, of Mississippi, and also parts of Louisiana where it made ground, there was a storm surge of 28 feet. That is as high as a tsunami in Asia. But that's not what happened on Lake Pontchartrain, because New Orleans actually got lucky. The storm, the Katrina missed New Orleans. It, you know, it was the failure of the flood walls that should have held the storm of Katrina as, as it came in through the lake. Um, but there is a solution that's, in a way, almost the easiest solution to that problem, is those gates would hold back the surge. Uh, you know, again, expensive, but 
this, this is an example of what they did in Holland and is very doable. I, I, you know, that engineering, it's not easy, but you, know, there are, you don't need to develop any new technologies or anything like that to build those gates. Well, so we're in a lot better shape than we were before Katrina. For one thing, the flood protection system that's being, you know, that's been restored uh, or improved, those things will work this time. We're pretty sure that they actually will function as opposed to last time when the design simply failed. And there were actually people in the Corps of Engineers who predicted the failure and actually predicted the mechanism of failure but there was no communication. You know, the Corps of Engineers, they didn't invent silos, but they perfected them. And, and they actually, they have a uh, waterways experiment station in Vic Vicksburg, and they looked at the design, they say, well, this is gonna fail, but they never told the people building the, the flood walls. Uh, and even a contractor building the flood wall uh, said this isn't gonna work, and they went to court instead of, uh, and, and the Corps of Engineers won. Instead of having engineers look at the contractor's complaints, they, the, its lawyers just fought the contractor's demand to build it right and make more money. Uh, but the system right now, I think, is pretty well built. You know, we get, as a member of the levy board, we get whistleblower complaints on a routine basis saying this part of the levy is, is structurally deficient, that part of the levy is structurally deficient, and so forth. And we, every time we've gone to investigate, there's been no problem. They've been good levies. Uh, so I, I'm pretty confident that that'll work. It sort of depends on the track of the hurricane as to what the situation is right now. The biggest weakness in the system is where, let me go back to, uh, um, can't really see it on this map, it's too, uh, the map's too big. But uh, we are, well, you can sort of see it a little bit. In this area right over here, that's where the industrial canal or in the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway enter the city. And there, two days ago, or Saturday, I guess, they actually started driving piles to build a, a gate that would predict, protect uh, the industrial canal from storm surge. You may remember last year during Gustav, you saw pictures of the water overlapping over the tops of the walls on the industrial canal. Uh, when those gates are in place, that won't happen anymore. Uh, it's gonna be two years before that's completed. It's still vulnerable, but the whole area, the, the, the flood walls that line the industrial canal and so forth are in much better shape. We also think, although can't be tested, that they'll survive overtopping. And that's enormously important. It's called armoring the levee system. If something survives over topping, the only amount of water you get is like the water flowing over the top of a bathtub. You've got a problem, but you pump it out. But if the, the wall collapses, then you have the whole bathtub coming at you and the Gulf of Mexico is behind it, the ocean, then you have a catastrophe. So as long as they survive over topping, and honestly, I'm not confident they'll do that. I have hopes that they'll do that. They have been reinforced somewhat in the key areas. Then, then we'll be in much better shape. But the 100-year protection should be, is supposed to be done by 2011. If it slips to 2012, frankly, it's very possible, or even a little bit beyond that. But if the system survives overtopping, 100, even if the system is overtopped, we will have a problem, not a catastrophe. Uh, but it's incomplete right now. Yeah.
Well, at least when we're talking about Louisiana, every word you hear from anybody involved in the projects is systems. We have to take a systems approach. The Corps of Engineers official report signed by the Chief of Engineers, General Carl Strzok, said that they had built a protection system, quote, in name only, unquote. And what he was getting at was that they would put a levy here and a levy there, but they never really integrated the system, nor really looked at it. That, you know, right now, at least in this system, the core is approaching it that way, so is the state. Uh, it's not easy, you know, then, then the question is, really your question is, how does that apply elsewhere? Are people paying any attention? You know, I, I between influenza, it's, it's funny, I consider myself a writer first and an historian second. Uh, I've written books that are not about disasters. In fact, I tell people I may write a book in the future that is a disaster, but I'm never writing about one again. You know, once is enough, but I've written, done it twice. Uh, but in both circumstances, I've sort of been pulled into the debate, and I've actually been very involved in influenza preparedness uh, for the last five years, quite intimately involved as recently as 10 days ago. Uh, and not to drop a name, but I'm going to be in the White House tomorrow talking about it. Uh, so I'll drop that name, okay? <laughs> Try to slip it into the conversation. Uh, people in, you know, so I deal with a lot of people in, in disaster preparedness type stuff. And they're all aware of the problem that you just raised. And certainly Katrina has made things, you know, that's a pretty good case study that got everybody's attention in the field of disaster preparedness. And in influenza, I think uh, that communication is second only to a vaccine in terms of its importance in dealing with communication. I'm going to talk about that at lunch, so I won't, don't want to get into it uh, right now. So all I can say is things are getting better because everybody's aware of it, but you still got people's turf at stake. You still have individual emotional reactions and things like that that are why silos exist in the first place. Uh, so hopefully it's getting better, but it ain't resolved. Yes, sir. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's bad. You know, we don't have the capacity that we had. My, my office is actually in the Tulane School of Public Health. Um, now that survived quite well. It was, always been one of the more international public health schools in the country. It was actually the first school of public health in the United States in 1916. Hopkins came next in 1918. Uh, and the, the number, the exodus of physicians from New Orleans has been a major problem. I mean, I have many very close friends who are docs who left. Uh, there is vulnerability, there is no question about it, it's a problem. Uh, now regarding charity, you probably know there is an effort to, I mean, there will be another, there's going to be a major medical center built there. We're not sure exactly what facility they're going to use, whether they're going to reopen charity and re, rebuild it from the inside out, whether they're going to build an entirely new project a few blocks away, which is creating a lot of local antagonism because of historic buildings they want to destroy and so forth. And there's a study that charity could be rebuilt cheaper for $150 million less than this new structure and so forth. But it will happen. There are plans that, in the states behind it as well as the city and, and both Tulane and LSU. And there's friction between Tulane and LSU for that matter as well. And the VA is definitely committed to building a hospital. So there's going to be a major medical complex here, not unlike the one in Birmingham. And of course, they'd prefer to emulate Houston and become a major national center. Uh, but 10 years from now, we'll be in a lot better shape. Right now, very vulnerable. And there is a yes, sir. Well, 
Well, it sort of depends on, on what plan you want, but, and you know, this hasn't been priced out from an engineering perspective with any kind of detail, uh, but th th this is over a period of decades and includes a significant contribution to the state, so this is not all federal funds, uh, but probably in the neighborhood of $100 billion for the entire state in coastal Mississippi. Uh, but as I say, even at that price tag, and again, it's over a number of decades, and includes, you know, and the state will be putting up tens of billions as well, so it's not all coming from the federal government. That number also includes a 50% contingency fund for cost overruns. So it's actually, if any, it might be even a conservative estimate, but it's a big number. And one of the problems is the escalation of costs since Katrina. The biggest cost in building levees is dirt. And the price for a ton of dirt has gone up six times since Katrina. So, you know, you can't barge the stuff in. That's way too expensive. But it, it's a big number. You know, uh, I don't know the precise number for the gates at the Wrigley's, which would be a major help. But anyway, we're, we're talking about protecting about 400 miles of coast from Mississippi to the Texas line, all of which relates to the Mississippi River. But primarily the, the energy infrastructure, the port system, the densely populated urban areas, things like that. So what it, it works out to be year by year uh, it's hard to say, but uh, significant, real money. Yeah. Yeah. That, a very good question. Um, you know, I've been to Holland. I've looked at their system. And the, the Dutch in 1953 had a Katrina-like event. They made a commitment to build the storm surge barrier you saw and, and other things. They were never going to let that happen again. And they made a lot of mistakes. I mean, their, their flood protection system works great. But along the way, they, they just made environmental, I mean, enormous environmental damage, which is now coming back to haunt them, and they have to, to go back and sort of retrofit, uh, repair, restore, change the system that they built because of that damage, which has had economic impact on them and also, for that matter, has increased the risks of Rhine flooding. Uh, so the riverine flooding is more of a problem. In this case, uh, and what we're trying to do, what most of the money is doing, is restoring the coast. That's where a lot of the money goes. There's not that much more to be done in terms of raising levees. We're not pr proposing to build a fortress. We're pr the most of the money is spent to actually restore environmental considerations and use the natural barriers that used to exist that all the interventions of humans, I I'll get you in a second, sir, you can put your hand out. Uh, that all the interventions of humans have screwed up. Uh, the, let's see, what's it? I was going to say something specific, but it slips my mind, so uh, uh, I'll go on to the next gentleman. Yeah. Oh, oh I don't remember, excuse me, let me, the point I wanted to make, return, in terms of rising sea level, and this is very important. Louisiana is actually in a better condition than most of coastal, areas around the world because the system is alive. The coastal marsh is alive. This deltaic system, the alluvial river, is alive. And what that means is that the marsh will adjust to rising sea level if you give it enough sediment. So that Louisiana actually, I mean, that marsh will rise with the consensus view of sea level projections. If the worst case sea level projections are true, New Orleans has got a big problem. But the reality is so is every place in the world. So is New York City. And New York is built on a rock, and you can't raise that rock. But 
you know, so New Orleans is the least of the world's problems if the worst case projections are true. But if the consensus views are true, the marsh will likely be able to rise with sea level if we give it enough sediment. Uh, so that was the point I wanted to make. And then. Right. Uh, yes. I mean, the present mouth of the river has only been there about seven or eight hundred years, which, of course, is less than the blink of an eye in geologic terms. And by now, it actually, there was a very big flood in 1973, and there's another uh, route to the sea, which is about 100 miles shorter, so the slope is steeper. So, uh, you know, that's the Mississippi. This is the Chafalaya would come straight down here. You can see it's much shorter, steeper slope. And the natural inclination of the river would be to go down the Chafalaya. Uh, they've got a, you know, some major engineering structures north of Baton Rouge to prevent that from happening. And, you know, there is a commitment to keep, obviously, Baton Rouge and New Orleans would, you know, the sea would, end, if the river went, went the other route, the ocean would come up to Baton Rouge, and, which is the bottom of the river from, for almost 300 miles, probably more than that, from the mouth of the river up to, up to Pro Lake Providence uh, in Louisiana. It's probably close to 400 miles by river. The bottom of the river, in fact, I think maybe all the way to Vicksburg, the bottom of the river is below sea level. So you would get saltwater intrusion going all the way up there. Uh, and that would create enormous problems, uh, you know. So yes, simple qu answer to your question, where the old river control structure and so forth will keep the river going down the Mississippi. And you, yes, sir. Ah. Right. Well, I, w I was unaware that they that they said take it down. I, you know, I'm not an expert on on the Upper Mississippi. I'm not sure. I'm. I. I well, my instinct is, are they nuts? But you know. <laughs> Whether or not they actually have a good reason for it or whether it's a blind bureaucracy, you know, the Corps is a lot better than it used to be, a lot better. I know for since my, my book, The Rising Tide, came out in 97, and uh, the Corps has been, you know, I've had excellent relationships with people in senior leadership positions with the Corps ever since. One of my closest friends, I used to play football with him 25 years ago, uh, ran the Corps of Engineers, uh, and that's long before I ever thought of writing that book. And the people at the top are very smart, good, capable people. But you've got a bureaucratic system, and it's always tough to move a bureaucracy. Uh, an event like Katrina really shook them up and has made them more responsive. You would have thought the 93 flood would have. Now. A guy named Jerry Galloway, who's also a retired general, did a, a magnificent report on the 93 flood for the White House. Made something like 99 or 105 or however many it was recommendations on policy changes that should be implemented. One policy change of those 100 recommendations was implemented. So. Yeah, uh, the question was, uh, this is uh, an uh, invasive species from South America called Nutria, and they eat an unbelievable amount of, of vegetation that grows in, in the marsh. I mean, literally unbelievable, and that is a major problem, and, you know, they're allowed to be hunted, people trying to, do, to be hunted, people are 
trying to develop a taste in restaurants for the meat to create demand for it and so forth. But that is a great example of an invasive species that is a, that is a major, major problem in the United States. Uh, they're called Nutria. They make very nice coats, N-U-T-R-I-A, and they're, they're, a bit, they're like a 40, 50-pound rat. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> when Mr. Berry answered the question about public